How is everyone today? <laughs> okay. Uh, today's the 16th. So the, the, the last time, we, when, when we left last time, uh, we were talking about the integral. So in particular, uh, what, we, what we defined last time and talked about is we talked about uh, the lower sum, the, uh, the, the lower sum at resolution n, the upper sum at resolution n, the limit of the lower sum, and the limit of the upper sum, and that we said that a function f is integrable when what? Right. So in integrable when, when these two both exist and, and are equivalent to each other. Uh, very good. So now to, today the question is, uh, today the question is, is what, what can be integrated? And, and not just what can be integrated, but by extension also what cannot be integrated. Okay. So let's have an example of something that cannot be integrated. So this is a very famous function that unfortunately is named D like half of everything in math. Uh, we'll say that, uh, that the evaluation is 1 if x is in the quotients intersect 0, 1 and 0 otherwise. So this is kind of a weird function. Uh, let's let's let, let's see what this means. So, uh, in the first place, if you get too far away from the unit interval zero to one, uh, it's going to be zero everywhere. Okay. So, so uh, the only place where it's non-zero is is at certain places in the interval zero to one. Uh, but for example, what is d evaluated at the square root of two? Zero. It's zero at the square root of two, uh, and uh, however, at one point four. Uh, sorry, square root of two is not even in there. Uh, how about <laughs> how about one over the square root of two? What is d evaluated at one over the square root of two? Zero. Okay. Whereas uh, d evaluated at say zero point seven one, that's one. That's one. So if we were to plot this function, if we were to plot it then uh, out, uh, in the interval 0 to 1, it would, be, it would, it would have some, some interesting properties. But outside, it's all 0. So it's 0 everywhere out here and 0 everywhere in here, uh, everywhere over here. But when you, get, when, you, when, you, when you get in the interval 0 to 1, it is 1 sort of a lot of the times. But it's also zero a lot of the times. Is that showing up up there? A little bit. So what I what I want you to see is let's let's take a particular uh, let's take a particular cube. So uh, remember at resolution Zero. Well, in the first place, what wh wh what is the shape of the cubes for this particular problem? They're not squares. They're little line segments, right? They're little line segments because, uh, after all, the signature of D is R to R. So that means that 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 the dyadic paving that we're dealing with, D N, is is paving this up. Is, is paving this, so it's little line segments. <coughs> so suppose that we take suppose that we take a particular line segment, like uh, uh, like per, suppose it turns out that this is one of the cubes. That this little line segment that I'm indicating right there. That C. In uh, at the nth resolution uh, of 
of there. We don't need to consider cubes out here because, because the function support is not out there. So the integral over here and over here will not accumulate anything. So my question to you is, is for this particular C, for this C, uh, what, is, what is the supremum, uh, to be clear, well, what is the supremum over this C for function D? What's the supremum? One. It's one. It's one because uh, every interval, every interval of, of the reals contains uh, a rational number. They're dense. They're everywhere in, in, the, in the real line. So there's always going to be, uh, there's always going to be a particular x where d evaluates to 1. So it's equal to 1 because uh, q intersect c is not empty. It's not the empty set. So what, what is the, the, the usual name that we use for, for soup when we're doing integrals? We're usually using big M, right? Big M. So uh, another name for this is big M of C uh, of D. Th this this will be one. So that's interesting. Just in that just in that particular interval, uh, all of the big M's f for for the C's that, that fall that fall in that interval, they're all one. How about the little M's? That is to say, <coughs> suppose I ask about uh, the nth over that particular C of this function d, what's the nth of it? Zero. Uh, why will the nth be zero? Yeah, because, because just like the rationals themselves are dense, the irrationals are also dense. So no you, you take an interval of the reals, in every interval there's an irrational number. And, and d is zero. Uh, at every, at every irrational number. So this is equal to zero because Q complement intersect C is also not empty. So as a result, little m is zero. Well, what does that say? What does that say about uh, the lower and upper sum? So as a result, From, from number one, we can compute the upper sum directly. What's going to be the upper sum? So, to, to, uh, to, to be clear, from one, we can compute un of d. Well, this is the summation of all the cubes that are in the dyadic paving at resolution n of big M over C of D times the volume uh, volume uh, and that's the one volume, right? I need my one volume of C. Okay. Well, we know what M what uh, what big M of C is? What is it? It's one, but just just in in the interval zero to one. So this is this is equal to uh, the summation over all C's in D N. But it must also be the case that C is uh, a cube in zero to one. And that's equal to uh, the volume, the, the the volume of C. So I replaced I replaced uh, big M with one, and I I noted the additional restriction that the cubes must be in the unit interval. Well, this this altogether is just a fancy way to say how big is the unit interval. Well, how big is it? Its length is one. So this is one. So that is to say that the upper sum at every resolution is 1. So if we compute the limit as n goes to infinity, what's the limit? 
1. So therefore, <coughs> un of d converges to 1. Okay, and then 4 from uh, 2. I won't bother writing all the details. I think you can imagine them. Uh, what, is, what is going to be the value for ln of d? Zero. zero. The lower sum is zero. And furthermore, the lower sum, because it is always zero, converges to zero. So here, here's an example of a function that, that uh, the lower sum converges, the upper sum converges, yet this function is not integrable. Why not? Because they don't converge to the same thing. So this, this function uh, is, is an, an old and famous function. And the reason why it's named, uh, why, why I wrote it as d, is because this is the Dirichlet function. And I make no warranty as to whether or not I pronounced that correctly. <coughs> OK. Any question about this one? So this, this just can't be integrated. It can't be integrated according to, to, to what we have. But for those of you who are math majors, or you're going to go to math or statistics graduate school, you will figure out a, a different integral. You'll talk about a different integral altogether uh, that, that is very easily able to, to integrate this function. But we're just not going to talk about it now. I'm just, as a matter of foreshadowing, uh, you can do that. But just to tell you, the way we do it in our class is we, we chop up the domain and, and then, and then uh, act accordingly. But the way you do it in, in graduate school, should you go to graduate school, is you chop up the range. And you have to do something that's, at first, rather unintuitive. But uh, at any rate, we'll just move on. So oh, but the reason, the reason why this is not integrable in the end is that notice that on a single cube, on, on all of these cubes, <coughs> so for all uh, cubes in the dyadic paving with that cube <coughs> being a subset of, the, of this, what is the oscillation? of the d function on that cube. It's 1. So what's, what's happening is that, in a sense, no matter how, no matter how finely we, we parse the domain, the oscillation always stays big. OK? Let's, and by big, I mean uh, bounded away from 0. So let's look at another function. How about, um, how about for example, <coughs> Suppose I give you a function here, and now this is just conceptual now, like a drawing. Uh, suppose that I, I give you uh, this function. I'll do it in pencil. And suppose that that uh, it has it has an area in the calculus one sense. How, how how could you how could you compute this area, by the way? Supposing that this is y is f of x, and this a and this b, how is it that you compute that area? Right, you compute integral a to b. Okay, so uh, suppose that I take that f, I take that f, and I modify it just slightly. <clears throat> So, so far, it's exactly the same. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, take a point that's close to this middle fence here. And I'm going to remove it and move it somewhere else. So I could move it anywhere, up or down or, or, or wherever we like. Uh, but just to make the picture work uh, as nice as possible, I'm going to move it down to here. 
So notice that all, what I, all I did is I kind of just moved a point down. Okay, now so suppose that the, that, but these are otherwise the same. Suppose that this area, this, this shape has area five, then what's the area of this one? Also five. Uh, so the, the kind of intuitive reason why it should be this way is, I would say, uh, well, how much area was under that point anyhow? <laughs> None, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so what I want you to what I want you to observe is that this small modification I've made to the to the function doesn't change its integral, and it's sort of like what's where the integral is concerned. What what what's a single point among friends? Yes. So for any finite number of points we move in that way, the area will still remain unchanged. Okay. So I I agree entirely with that. So that it, so I haven't demonstrated that this is true yet. But supposing I supposing I do, if if you can if you can modify exactly one point, then you should be able to modify you should be able to carry out this argument for any finite number of points. So if it works for one, it should work for two. It should work for two million, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for infinitely many. But it will work for 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 any finitely many. So let's see why uh, why this shouldn't have changed uh, anything. So the reason why it won't change anything is as follows. <coughs> okay, so then... Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to cut, cut this into cubes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to divide each one of these twice so that there will be eight slices. Okay, now, uh, we, so the cubes, remember, are down here in the, in the domain. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to vi visually illustrate what the lower and upper sum are. Okay, so uh, the lower sum is in each one of those strips. We want to make the tallest, re <coughs> the tallest rectangle that's under. Okay, so like this, this, uh, this. Now here's the question. Uh, how, how, tall is the, how tall is the lowest one on this strip? It's zero, right? It's all the way down here at the bottom. Because, because I moved that point down there. Okay, then uh, this one, this one, this one, that one. So the lower sum is, is the areas underneath those rectangles. Uh, then the upper sum would be, okay, do, ex do a similar thing, but now, now do be above. <clears throat> and what I want to point out to you is that the, the, the main thing that we have to contend with is, is the difference between the lower and the upper sum. So specifically, on this, say, on this cube right, uh, right here, for that cube, the oscillation is, is the height between the lower and upper rectangles. It's this right here. So I just, I just shaded that part in. And then the, the overall oscillation is, is, the, is the height between all of these. So now, notice what happened in that, in that one strip where I made a modification. It made the oscillation really big. Right? And in particular, in particular, whichever cube, whichever cube ends up, so this whole thing is the oscillation on that, on that particular strip. Whichever cube ends up, uh, let's say it like this, at every resolution, there has to be exactly one cube that contains that modification that I made. There has to be one. Okay. But what's, what will happen is as, as uh, we make the resolution finer and finer, even though that rectangle remains tall, what will happen to it? It's going to get arbitrarily thin. So the area, the area that's going to, to end up, uh, the offending area is going to end up shrinking away to zero as the resolution gets finer and finer. And <laughs> all of these oscillations will get closer and closer too. 
Okay, suppose I look at a slightly different function. So how about how about say this function? And you can think of this as a modification as of, of the one above if you like. Something like this. So will this function be integrable? Yeah. So on the one hand, you could kind of think of it like, well, OK, uh, if I was to just look at that, yeah, that looks like just that part is integrable. And just the other part, well, with the exception of that one point, that should be integral, integrable too. So, <clears throat> so uh, what, I, what I want for you to observe, again, is that if we make a, if we make a partition, choose a relatively fine uh, Uh, a relatively fine resolution, then we can compute the lower and upper sum, so lower, 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 uh, lower, lower, lower. <coughs> and the upper sums, so upper, 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 upper. So there's just one. There's just one that has a noticeably big oscillation, that place where we have the jump discontinuity. All the others, all the others uh, have um, a, a small oscillation. So this, this one, this cube has a big oscillation, and all these other cubes, they have a small oscillation. So this is going to be the, the crux of, of our method to detect whether or not, whether or not, um, uh, something is integrable. So this is going to be integrable because notice that no, ma no matter how fine I make this, so on, on one hand a problem is no matter how fine I make this, there's always going to be a place where the oscillation is big. But I can choose a fine enough resolution so that the cube on which the oscillation is big is arbitrarily small. So even though there can be big oscillations, the locations where they occur are few. Okay, so last illustration before we get to the to the theorem and proof. Okay, so now I'm going to make a uh, a what what I want you to imagine is that I'm going to draw a function that would normally fit in this kind of. Uh, this kind of situation. So I'm going to I'm going to consider a function that is like r2 to r, but I'm not going to attempt to draw it. Rather, I'm going to do something slightly different. Uh, what I want you to consider is that uh, we're looking we're looking at r2. that is at the plane, we're looking at the domain. Suppose that, suppose this here is the support of our function. So what does that mean? Yeah, that's, that's the location where the function is non-zero. Suppose that the function is non-zero but just, just on this set. And suppose further that it has some kind of weird discontinuity. Uh, a discontinuity like the following, where uh, it's discontinuous all along this strip. So, to help make the illustration clear, what I'm saying is consider a surface you can even even consider this to be the surface. So it's a discontinuity all along that line. So there's there's a surface. And you can imagine that we're we're gonna integrate that surface and you can turn it from the side and see, ah, oh, it's discontinuous there, isn't it? <coughs> okay. Uh, 
Okay. So now we want we want to uh, let, let's say that, that that's the that's the place where it's discontinuous. What we're going to do is we're going to cube up we're going to cube up the uh, the, the support. Uh, and what, what will be the shape of the cubes in this example? Squares, right? They'll be squares. Uh, last, last time they were intervals, this time they're squares. Okay, so we'll cube the domain. Uh, so this and then half. Okay, and so now uh, I cubed it up a little bit, and now I want you to observe that uh, that the, the discontinuity is just in these ones in the middle. So I'm just going to I'm just going to uh, increase the resolution in the ones in the middle, so I don't have to draw too many lines. So I'll increase the resolution of this one. and the resolution of this one. Okay, then I'll further increase the resolution in, in the ones that I still have an intersection. And uh, so, so, can we agree that I could I could continue this process for for ar arbitrarily far, and I could make I could make the the actual uh, cubes that are containing this discontinuity as as small as as we wish. So because this is where the discontinuity is, because this is where the discontinuity is, that's where the oscillation is going to remain high. It, it'll never get small for those. So this is a high oscillation cube. This is a high oscillation cube. That one's high oscillation, that one's high oscillation, that one's high, that one's high, that one's high, that one's high, and that one's high. But as I increase the resolution, I can make those high oscillation cubes, the, 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 the area of those high oscillation cubes as small as I wish. I can make it smaller and smaller and smaller. Yes? So for the last one, we have the condition that we can move an infinite amount of points down. Mm -hmm. So we have infinite amount of points, then there'll be too many points to have the oscillation you have. Po possibly. Possibly. So for this one, we do have an infinite number of points. Yes. So do we have a similar condition? So, so, can, so can you see it? It's a good question. What, 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 do, what do these have in common? One is a cross section. Okay. So you could kind of say, like, well, if we were looking at, if we were looking at this surface right here, uh, and if you were to take a cut of it this way, you might see something like that. Okay, I agree. Yes? Ah, exactly this. Right? So then, how big are the cubes? <coughs> how big are the cubes in this case? What, what, I mean, what I mean is, what is the dimensionality of the cubes here? One dimensional. And this, this, uh, this location where the oscillation remains fixed, where it sort of can't be massaged away. How, how big is this one point? What's its dimensionality? Zero. This is a zero dimensional problem in a sense. Similarly, this is also a zero dimensional problem. Okay, now, how big, what, what is the dimensionality of the cubes in, in, in this? Two dimensional. But how big is dimensionally is the problem? One dimensional. Okay, so this is not exactly the story, but this is more or less the story. So, to get the exact story, here we go. Uh, okay, so a function, f from rn to r, that is bounded with bounded support, is integrable
if and only if. So this is nice because this is telling you exactly what the condition is. Not only is this a necessary condition, it's also a sufficient condition. So this tells you exactly when you can do this. So uh, it's, it's, it's integrable when uh, the summation, <coughs> well, first off, I have to say for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an n greater than zero such that the summation over all the cubes in the dyadic paving at that resolution <coughs> uh, that have the property that the oscillation over that cube of the function is more than epsilon, you, that's, that's what we're summing over, and what we're going to sum is the volume, the end volume of those cubes, this should be less than epsilon. <coughs> so now this, <laughs> this is kind of a, 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 a difficult statement to parse, yes? So you said the oscillation f is less, is greater than epsilon. Uh, greater than epsilon, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I, I hope I said epsilon, but, it, but at any rate, I, I, I wrote zero. So this should be greater than epsilon. Okay, so now let's, let's, uh, let's go over this. So the meaning of this statement, we're summing over not all cubes, just some cubes. So what we're doing is we're talking about, consider all the cubes in the dyadic paving at at resolution n. And what we're going to do is we're going to sort of label them as being high oscillation or low oscillation. What I mean is, for example, uh, here, here is a cube. Is it a high oscillation cube or a low oscillation cube? A low oscillation cube. And this one is a high oscillation cube. So what I'm saying is that to be big, to have a cube with big oscillation, that means we're going to choose some epsilon. Now, a function could have high oscillation even if it's not, e even if it's continuous, right? Because, for example, you could have a, you could have, say, a, uh, a line that just happens to have very steep slope. Okay, it could have very steep slope, a and it could have, it could have a high oscillation, like a line with slope 100 over an interval of one. Well, its oscillation would be 100, wouldn't it? So that'd be big. So, so what, this, what this condition means, this is saying, <coughs> conceptually, cubes with big oscillation, with big in scare quotes. And so that's saying, okay, let, let's, let's, Let's sum over all of the cubes with big oscillation, and we're going to sum up all of their volumes. We're going to sum up all of their volumes, and we need the sum of all the volumes to be less than epsilon. So this is saying, <clears throat> so this is, the, the total volume of big oscillation is small. Okay, so I hope you can understand the way I'm parsing out this sentence. So it's saying, uh, a function is integral, integrable exactly when, for all epsilon greater than zero, and you can think of this like you can think of this uh, as what it means to have a big oscillation. You select all the cubes that have a big oscillation. You sum up all of their volumes, and this has to be less than your criteria for having a big oscillation. Okay, so let's prove it. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, we'll suppose. <clears throat> Uh, 
suppose that uh, suppose that that uh, that this is true. Well, in in, in the first place, mm. actually, I need to make a, a side remark. Okay, to make sure that we all understand the, the argument that's coming. So the number, 0 0.999 repeating. Okay. So what is this number equal to? One. It's equal to 1. Now, now, why is it equal to 1? I integrals? <laughs> so, uh, this is kind of a, 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 a weird way to understand, uh, to understand math. Like, this is sort of a, a fundamental way to prove something. Okay, let's, let's compute the difference between these two numbers. So the claim is that they're the same number. If, if, if that's true, then we should be able to subtract them and get zero, right? And in particular, if we subtract them, it, it, it couldn't possibly be the case that we get something that's non-zero. Okay, so let's consider. Consider uh, the expression 1 minus 0 0.9 repeating. So everyone that I've ever met can usually agree that this is greater than or equal to zero. Right? That is to say, if, e if either one's going to be bigger, one's going to be bigger. So can we, can we agree to that much? It couldn't possibly be the case that 0 0.99999 is, bi is bigger than 1. Okay. So now say let, let epsilon greater than 0 be given. And by that I mean let, let's consider, uh, let's consider a, a very small number. Let's consider a very small number, uh, epsilon. Uh, so then uh, there exists there exists a uh, a capital N greater than zero such that uh, ten to exponent negative n, which is equal to zero point zero zero zero. Uh, one. So how many zeros do we have there, by the way? Are there n of them? Should be n minus one of them, right? So this will be in the nth position. So there'd be n minus one zeros. It doesn't really matter how many zeros there are. But at any rate, uh, can we agree that I can always get, I can always choose an n that's, that's, less, than, that's less than epsilon? <coughs> It's always going to be possible, uh, always possible to do this. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so how do we how do we <laughs> how do we proceed from here? How do we proceed? From here? Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, well, let's consider what is what is one minus ten to exponent n. If we were to if we were to do that, right. <clears throat> so this would be equal to zero point nine nine nine. Nine exactly <coughs> finitely many nines. Okay, how many? How many nines? Uh, is it is it n of them? Yeah, exactly n nines. Okay, now what? Well, we have to we have to 
uh, consider uh, the, the, the difference here. <clears throat> Add what together? Surely, but what does that have to do with this one? Yes? Okay. Sorry? Okay, I mean, uh, so, so you're, you're saying, w w okay, so I, okay, I, t I take it, okay, now I see what y'all are saying. I was thinking about it a completely different way. Now I think I see what you're saying. You're saying, uh, let, let n go to infinity? Ah, okay. <clears throat> I was, I was thinking about it a different way. This is fine. Uh, so if we say let, let n go to infinity, uh, then can we agree that this difference, that 1 minus uh, 10 to exponent negative n, suppo supposing that n goes to infinity, this would go to 0 0.9 repeating. We'd have, we'd have arbitrarily many 9s. So here's a way to get n in nines, and if we let this go to infinity, uh, well, that's going to go to 0 0.99999. Okay. Uh, then, yeah, 10 to negative n should go to 0. Why should it go to 0? Well, in, in, in the end, because it, it, can be, it can be made less than any positive epsilon, right? So it goes to goes to goes to this and uh, ten. So we got derailed in the end, is what happened here. <laughs> so the the point is is to be able to uh, the reason why the difference between one and zero point nine repeating is zero is because you can you can always place them within a ball of radius epsilon to each other for any positive epsilon. So you could say, well, are they within uh, the width of a hydrogen atom? Yes. Well, how about half of that? Are they always within half that width? And the answer is yes. So as a result, you, you can't possibly separate them by any distance, so they have to be identical. Okay. For this reason. <clears throat> Second remark. Is that... Uh, is that this is this is an obvious consequence of the definition of integral? Is that f uh, bounded with bounded support is integrable? Integrable when for all epsilon greater than zero there exists an n greater than zero, <coughs> such that uh, the difference between the upper sum at that resolution uh, minus the lower sum at that resolution is less than epsilon. That's just saying <clears throat> that in order to be integrable, that means that these two have to converge to the same thing, which means that they have to get arbitrarily close to each other. Otherwise, they couldn't, uh, couldn't possibly be integrable. OK, so now. <clears throat> Suppose that uh, we have the following. So for the proof of the theorem. Let epsilon be greater than 0. And let n uh, satisfy, specifically, let n satisfy. Uh, we need to name, name this. So we'll call this the inequality. 1. Let n satisfy 1. OK. Well, let's compute. What is the difference between un of f minus ln of f? OK. Well, this will be the summation. 
over all the cubes in the dyadic paving uh, in the dyadic paving of big M over that cube of F times the volume of that cube. So this is the upper sum. And now we need to now we need to subtract the lower sum. So sum over all the cubes in the dyadic paving. And now what goes here? Little m. Okay, now, the fact that uh, F is uh, bounded means that uh, big M is finite for, for every C, and little m is finite for every C. Furthermore, the fact that F has bounded support means that uh, this is a finite summation, meaning that there's only finitely many cubes that actually contribute to this, because you could, you could in a sense, Cover all of uh, cover all of B's support with just some ball. That's what it means to be bounded, and then only finitely many cubes of any given resolution can fit inside that ball. So this is a finite sum, and this is a finite sum. As a result of both of those sums being finite, Uh, as a result of, bo of, of both of those sums being finite, we can say that this is the sum over C in the dyadic paving of, now I can combine the sums. It wouldn't be possible to combine them if, this, if there were infinitely many things here and infinitely many things here. So this will be M C F minus little m C F volume. And C. So now, what is big M uh, minus little m? We have even a name for that. That's the oscillation. So now this is the sum <coughs> over the cubes at that resolution of the oscillation over s that cube of F times the volume of that cube. Okay, now. What we're saying is that we, we chose an N, a big N, that satisfied this inequality, which is to say, we said, let epsilon greater than zero be given. So that's like saying, please tell me what it means for, for, for you to have a big oscillation. That's represented by epsilon. So every one of these cubes either has a, has a big oscillation or does not have a big oscillation. So now I'm going to split this finite sum into two different pieces. The part of the sum where the oscillation is big and the part of the sum where the oscillation is small. Okay. <coughs> so here's the part where the oscillation is big. So we're saying we're going to sum over all the cubes uh, in the paving. <coughs> and furthermore, we want this to be the we want it to be the case that for these cubes, the oscillation over that cube of the function is more than epsilon. Okay. Uh, then this is oscillation over the cube of F. And then plus, now these are going to be uh, the, the, the cubes with small oscillation. So all the cubes in the paving where the oscillation uh, is small. So what does it mean to be small? Less or equal to epsilon, right? Less or equal to epsilon. And then this is oscillation over the cube, uh, volume, in C. <clears throat> okay. Uh, what, what just happened there? <laughs> Oscillation of F. Okay. So 
So now let's think about this. By hypothesis, by hypothesis, if if I ignore if I ignore this 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 term I just this factor for a moment. And if we were to to sum up all of these, and if I if I ignore this thing I'm covering up, what is this sum? This is this is something less than epsilon. It's something less than epsilon. Uh, sim si similarly, similarly, um, <clears throat> how big, if I, if I cover up this one, if I cover up this one right here, how big is that? Wh wh how big is it? Less, less or equal to epsilon. That's what, that's what we're saying right here. So what's going to happen here is now these are all equalities, so this is equal, 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 equal. So I haven't, th this is all equal now, but now I start playing some games of estimating. <coughs> so what I'm, what I'm going to do is that because, because this is the part of, in this sum, this is the part that's small, I'm going to, I'm going to ask how big, could this how big could this possibly be? And in this sum, because, because that's the part that's small, I'm going to ask, how big could that possibly be? Okay. So now, uh, for, for this one, for this one, just this part, ju just this sum. This is the oscillation of f over, over each individual cube that we're summing over. Well, f is, f is bounded, right? It's bounded. So, I'm going, to, I'm going to replace this, I'm going to replace this with the oscillation of f over its entire domain. Okay, because the oscillation on this cube has to be less or equal to the oscillation on the entire domain. So, we're, I'm going to replace, uh, oscillation on that cube of f with just oscillation of f, and by that I mean over all of Rn. And what I want you to see is that this is bounded. Why is this bounded? Because by hypothesis the function is bounded with bounded support. But notably, this is now some possibly big thing, but constant. It's a constant value. Similarly, For this one, I'm going to replace, well, this. I'm going to replace all of these with this has to be less or equal to this. So I just, <laughs> I had formerly written equal, but that was nonsense. This is, this is less or equal. And so now, I'm going to replace, I'm going to replace uh, the volume of that cube with, okay, now I want you to imagine, suppose that, uh, suppose that, you know, we, we've been making, you know, in our imagination, we've been making the, the cubes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller to get really, really, really uh, fine cubes, to get a finer and visor, finer resolution. Now we're going to go the other way. Now I'm saying, now let's make the cubes big, bigger, 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 so that they can have uh, they could have uh, sides that are millions of units long, so million by million by million. We can always arrange, uh, we can always arrange it so that the entire support, the entire support of this function is, is within just a few very large cubes. Okay, and that cube could have an enormous volume, but a, but a constant volume. Okay, so th I'll replace this volume this will be less or equal to uh, the volume, uh, volume <coughs> of some C, hmm, what do I want to call it? C star. Such that uh, C star contains the support of f. 
Okay, so now what I'm saying is that this factor is going to be replaced with something that's bigger. This factor is going to be replaced with something that's bigger. So now to continue this, to continue this, I now have to write, I now have to write that this is less or equal, less or equal, the sum over all the cubes in the dyadic paving, or the oscillation over that cube is big, So now this is being replaced with that. The total oscillation Rn, and then this is volume in C, and then plus summation over all the cubes that are in the paving. Uh, the oscillation has to be small. The oscillation has to be uh, has to be less or equal to epsilon. Uh, but now, because of because of this, uh, the way we the the way we change this, it has to be the case that we're only collecting the ones where C uh, intersects uh, C star. So C intersects this, this one cube to rule them all. And the reason why is because we, we don't want to collect, uh, we don't want to collect any, uh, any part of the integral where, where there's no support. So where this is not empty. Okay, and we're replacing uh, that with that. Okay, so then oscillation. <laughs> wow, this is really complicated, isn't it? <laughs> uh, we're replacing that with uh, the volume <coughs> n of C star. Okay, fine. <coughs> so now, the thing is, is that now this is a constant, this, this factor is a constant, and this factor is a constant, which means what? You can factor them out of the sum. So this is equal to now uh, the oscillation over all the overall input of F, the summation uh, over all the cubes in the paving where the oscillation is small. Uh, no, where the oscillation is big. And then what's left in the sum is the volume. And then plus, now I'm factoring out the volume of C star times the sum of, uh, what am I trying to say? So the volume of C star, uh, the oscillation, uh, oscillation, what, what gets left in here? Oscillation of C. Oscillation over C of F. Okay. Now what can we invoke? So now, ignoring, ignoring this factor for a moment, ignoring this factor for a moment, and ignoring that. Well, we, ha <laughs> we have a name for that that you can see there. What is that by hypothesis? That's less than epsilon. That's the volume of all the cubes that have big oscillation. So that volume right there is less than epsilon. So now I'm going to replace that whole sum with epsilon. So this is the oscillation over the whole thing of that. Well, not, not equal. Now it's less than. Less than. Uh, where? This one? No, this is equal. So this is equal, 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 less or equal, and then equal because all I did was, was factor, out, factor out a constant. Okay, so now this is epsilon 
and then plus. Okay, now what can we do? <clears> hey, <throat> okay, let's think about it for a second. I don't, I don't understand what you're what you're saying. So we need to we need we can do one more thing. Oh, I didn't even write any of this. Look at that. Oh my goodness. C is in the dyadic paving, and furthermore, the oscillation over C of F is small, and C intersect C star is not empty. Okay, now what? Can we replace the summation by the Okay. So so uh, I I ask you, can we? It it would have to be epsilon times uh, times the number of cubes. Let let's think here. Did I do something? Something is seeming not right to me. So how many, so these are all smaller than epsilon. Each one of these is smaller than epsilon. But there's potentially a lot of them. Like this could be millions and millions of epsilons. Right? So does everyone see the, the place we're trying to get past? So I was able to replace this with a single epsilon because that was part of the hypothesis. Now how are we going to get past this part. Uh, I can see I can see the mistake that I made. Uh, it's way back in the middle. Ah. Uh, <laughs> now I see it. Uh, now, how, what's the shortest way to fix it? Okay, let's think about it for just a second. There is no short way to fix it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. How much time do we have? Uh, we've got five minutes. I can fix it. Okay, so... Ah. Uh, It's this one that needs to come out. Mm, it's this one that needs to become. To, okay, so now, so now, uh, I pointed to the wrong one. This is the one that needs to come out. Why does this one need to be the one to come out instead of me trying to take that one out? So I, I want to make sure everyone one sees because because it, it's informative when when the instructor. M m makes a makes a tactical error, so l l l the tactical error that I made is in this sum. In this sum, we have we have two factors. <coughs> we have two factors, and I thought I needed to take this one out. I needed to take this one out, but in fact, uh, I could take this one out much easier and get to the end much easier. So I replaced the volume of one little cube with a volume of an enormous cube. Okay, rather than doing that, I could replace oscillation, the oscillation with, um, with what? By hypothesis. With epsilon. That's what I should have done. So, I'm so sorry that this is now all confused. So I'm going to replace, I'm going to perform this replacement. So, so not, not this. Okay, so, so suppose I do that. That happens. <laughs> okay, so this will be less or equal to, now that oscillation is replaced with epsilon. 
that volume is unchanged. Ah, uh, now I see it. Okay, so now we have that epsilon. So now what can be factored out? Epsilon. That epsilon. Ah. So now we factor out that epsilon, and now we've got a bunch of these little volumes. No, we still do need C intersect C star. The, re the reason why, the reason why is that now consider, now consider this whole sum right here. So this part needs to be erased also. So now this epsilon is that epsilon. <coughs> And what I need to do is I need to, I need to replace this sum with something possibly bigger. So now, what is this saying? Can someone put into, into as plain of English as possible, ignoring that epsilon for a moment, what is this sum saying? <coughs> yeah, this is, this is uh, all of the cubes that, are in, that, that contain any of the support of F where the oscillation is small. Okay, so then now, as an estimate, we could, we could say, well, what if all of them were small? What if, what if all of the cubes had small oscillation? Then this sum would be less than the sum of all the cubes that cover all of the support of F. So now what I'm saying is we could replace this entire sum with the volume of C star. an enormous cube that covers all of the support. Ah, now we have it. So, this is equal to epsilon multiplied by the oscillation over the whole reals of F plus the volume of something that contains all of the support of F. Well, this thing in parentheses is what? Okay, to, to a large extent it is base times height. <laughs> I agree. But, but uh, in particular, epsilon, it was arbitrary. But these things, these are constants, right? Because this is the, this is the oscillation of F over the entire, over the entire uh, support. And this is some big cube that contains all of the support. So this thing is a constant. So as a result of all of this, we now have that un of f minus ln of f is less than epsilon multiplied by that constant. And that, because that, that's constant, and we can make it smaller than epsilon times any constant, we can make it smaller than any, any epsilon that we wish. So we establish the result. So any, <laughs> any questions about the result? So to be, to be clear and to restate, something is integrable exactly when you consider uh, wh whatever threshold you want to say that this is a big oscillation. There, there must always be a resolution where, where uh, all of the cubes that have big oscillation are less than the threshold of what you consider to be big. Very good. Have a nice break. Thank you.